Hi everybody, and thanks for joining me today. So we are closing in on 70% done here. Woo so yeah, that's pretty exciting. I might want to select the color that I'm stitching with. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I had a friend over yesterday who is also a stitcher so we had a nice visit and stitch session <laughs> actually got a lot done almost 600 stitches yesterday wish i could do that every day <laughs> more like you know around th half that about 300 a day by average so of course it depends a lot on the pattern if you have a lot of confetti in the area you are stitching or not. Yeah, this part isn't too terribly bad. Oops, this part of the hedge here, but above it where the trees was a lot of confetti. And then I'll be moving into the stone pillar again. That part tends to go quicker since it's more of the vertical columns instead of colors scattered all over the place. So yeah, oh, it's kind of funny. I got told on Facebook the other day that I'm uh, I'm doing it wrong. I shouldn't have threads hanging. It's like you know what? No, there's no stitching police. The only way you're doing it wrong is if you're not happy with how it looks when you're done. Yeah, if you're if you're happy with the result and you're happy with the process, then it's the right way for you. You do you. Oh, that was parked, not done. There we go. Yeah, I mean, I used to stitch it that way, one color at a time and always finished off a thread before starting a new one. And then I decided to try something different and I like it this way, so. So yeah, I just said this happens to be the way I like to stitch. Yes, they also tried to throw, I've been stitching for 30 years at me. It's like, well, I have almost just as long. So who's to say one person's way is right and one person's way is wrong? I don't think there's any wrong way. Some people like to carry further than others. Some people use different ways of finishing and ending threads. People use different numbers of threads on the same count. Some people like three uh, strands for a 14 count. I like two. You just, yeah, you do you. There's enough things in life with rules in it. Let's not impose extra ones, right? <laughs> oh. That's why yeah, I always say it's my guidelines and I'll Change it depending on how it works with what I'm stitching. My only rule is my personal one that I always park in the upper right corner. So that is where I begin my stitches. Because, yeah, I parked, I tried for a while where I was parking some in the lower left and some in the upper right, but then you would end up sometimes with uh, two threads coming out of the same spot, and then it was hard to figure out which one went which direction. It was easier to get mixed up that way, so I quit doing that. Okay, 37.56. Oh, <laughs> I was searching in the wrong section amongst my envelopes. No wonder I couldn't find it envelope was in the right place and I was not. <laughs> Let's see if I can find a short little leftover piece. Ah, perfect. That is what I save those teeny little bits for. Mm. So yeah, I was thinking the other day, I want to thank you all who enjoy 
my videos and leave such uh, lovely comments about having chats with you. I was always told I talked too much <laughs> when I was a kid. So uh, it's actually very, very touching that you guys like that I can just uh, babble away <laughs> for an hour. <sighs> My son is very similar. Yeah, he can go on for hours about cars and street lights and train signals and my gosh it's actually interesting because he uh he had a bit of a speech delay actually he didn't really start talking till he was two and even then it was just you know one or two words not simple sentences like kids are often getting at those days so yeah there was a time when we thought maybe he'll never talk but uh, now he's like his mom and barely pauses for breath <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's kind of funny because he was one day just uh, being his chatterbox self. My husband said, my gosh, you know, he just goes and goes. And I said, oh, you got that for me? He said, really? I said, yeah, I guess I, I trained myself to not do it so much because I was always told I was annoying people. So, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's really nice. You guys don't mind. I can carry on a big one-sided con uh, conversation with you to listen to. <laughs> Ooh, like I said, I try to be somewhat entertaining. That's a really short piece to leave threaded, but I think we're good. So, yeah, working on this... Uh, garden wall or the hedge here and then yeah we're gonna get some more of the darker green hedges coming out here those colors are really pretty so I'm excited to get to that part such a lot of these nice deeper sort of aquamarine greens and blues very pretty yeah that was one thing I really liked with the um the picture that's in my uh, avatar, that's the uh, Make-A-Wish painting by Artisy Designs. And yes, I just, I loved the color palette on that one. All those beautiful blues and greens and a couple of purples. Yeah, that was a, that one was a pleasure to stitch. I enjoyed that one so much. That was one when I was still stitching from paper, which I have not done since I got Pattern Keeper. And I don't know if I ever will again. <laughs> I have been definitely spoiled by having an app to do the, uh, all the searching for you. 505. Oh yeah, not today, but I may be getting to another zero soon because I have just a few stitches left of it. And it's sort of all along the top of this wall here. There's like five of them left. So finally, I might get to another, uh, another zero. Yeah, I got to one a while back at like 40% done, and then there have been no zeros since. Now, oh, that's the case when you have a big pattern. Yeah, it can take quite a while to get to the zeros. Oh, pardon me. Yeah, I like when I get to the zeros and then uh, I can actually take those uh, envelopes out and put them back in my master set and then I have fewer of them to uh, search through when I'm looking for colors, so that makes the process go even faster. theme from a, a new saw a oh, new song a new show I found well new to me it's older but um it's called uh snowy river the McGregor saga and it's like um an Aussie western and uh yeah I'm on season two I'm quite enjoying it if you liked um Dr. Quinn medicine woman you'd probably like that one 
Yeah, that was another one I didn't discover until recently either. We weren't allowed to watch much TV when I was a kid. So I missed out on a lot of cultural phenomenons. I feel like even though I'm 40, I'm still catching up on stuff that was from my, uh, my generation. There's still sometimes people make cultural references I don't get. But that's one nice thing for uh, Google now or Urban Dictionary, right? You can look those things up. Ooh. Oh, I said, yeah, it's pretty funny. I said, I like having um, the world's uh, knowledge, you know, at my fingertips, the device I keep in my pocket. And then I said, you know, today I used it to look up of the origins of the joke about Prince Albert in a can. <laughs> oh, it's like, I'm not sure the, uh, the creators of the internet had that quite in mind as a use, but yeah. So the joke is they used to have a brand of tobacco called the Prince Albert blend and it was served, it was in tin. So yeah, he would call the, you know, the smoke shop or whatever, the tobacconist say, do you have Prince Albert in a can? And when they say yes, you say, well, then let him out. <laughs> it's so bad. I don't know why bad jokes just endure. Yes, I love my dreadful jokes. You know, they call them dad jokes, but in our family, I'm the one who tells them, and then my husband is the one who just shakes his head and walks off. Or, you know, if I text him, he texts me back saying, good God, you know. <laughs> oh, like, why do we groan at puns? They're actually quite clever some of the time. Oh. Yeah, so my friend's working on the project. Um, I think it's called A Room with a View by Heaven and Earth Designs. And uh, yeah, it's beautiful. And uh, she's doing hers in tent stitch, but it's on 28 count. So that's the holes are, you know, this is 14 count. That's 28. So they're half the size, right? So the uh, squares are smaller. And so you, I actually could not tell that it was not fully crossed unless you you know, you have it right up to your face, basically. So, yeah, I asked her if it goes faster. She said maybe because she's not sort of planning where her path to go, because she was like me, did the, the lower crosses of the legs first and then come back and cross them. So she said she would spend a lot of time sort of planning her path there and back, and now she just stitches it. So, yeah, I haven't tried tent, but maybe one day. I don't know. I like it the way it is. I'm a completist. I also already kitted up a bunch of projects um, with enough floss to do the full cross, so I would be left up with a lot of leftover, so that's another reason I might not. <laughs> ah, like I was saying earlier, where there's no one right way to stitch. Yeah, I've seen projects in tent that are beautiful and projects in full cross that are beautiful. Yeah, I just, I love this, uh, this craft, this art. And said, yeah, I can't paint or draw or any of that freehand stuff, but this basically putting little pixels in places, that I can do. Oh, and then of course there's the, the diamond painting they call, which is like little little beads or pieces basically that you stick to a canvas so a lot of people will do these same patterns but in that i said yeah but my my clumsy self would knock over all the little bits everywhere <laughs> oh oh it sounds like my food is here my meal subscription box but that's okay i'll leave it for a bit <laughs> it won't be the end of the world they 
actually ship them with ice packs and things so that they're um they're good for up to 48 hours so i'll let it sit there for a little bit while i finish up chatting and stitching with you guys they actually missed a week entirely a couple weeks ago yeah my box never got picked up by the uh the carrier so uh, they gave me a refund but yeah so it's kind of irritating because uh it's not just the food, it's the whole, I don't have to plan what to cook for half the week. So then I had to come up with something else to make. Yeah. That's why I did it, because I just found I was getting such, um, what do they call it? Like decision-making fatigue? Where you just, you're tired of making all the choices and you don't want to have to. It was nice, I can make those choices of just going through the menu and picking out the three meals that I want weeks in advance you know and and then it arrives on my doorstep all ready to go and uh yeah it's it's cheaper than eating out so there's that because yeah eating out has definitely gotten quite up there we went to like just one of the smaller sort of family diner chains last week and uh for the three of us it cost almost twice what we used to pay i felt like i mean obviously we hadn't gone out for quite a while because you know the pandemic but uh yeah prices have really gone up which i understand i mean gas being so expensive it costs more for them to get the food right food is more expensive for everybody including the restaurants so yeah we don't do that very much. Yeah, I used to love cooking, but you know, years have worn me down. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny because um, I never minded cooking for the big holiday meal because I, it's the same menu every time. And I could basically make it sleepwalking. So, uh, you know, my husband will say, oh, you don't mind cooking the big, you know, Christmas meal or whatever. It's like, well, no, because it's always the same thing. I make um, twice uh, baked roasted garlic potatoes, which are absolutely yummy. And... Um, stuffed cheese and broccoli stuffed chicken breast because we're not turkey people and uh green bean casserole because yum <laughs> and uh you know the basic stuffing cranberry sauce gravy so yeah it's so easy because i know exactly what i need i know exactly what to buy at the store i know exactly when to start making it because i've made it so many times so yeah it's not that it's the everyday having to decide what to make but he just don't want to have to choose anymore. Yeah, because I remember learning that, you know, when kids were little, they said, especially when they're younger, can get very overwhelmed with too many choices. So instead of giving them, you know, all of the choices, maybe give them two or three and have them pick from that. And if they say they want something else, then you can do it, but can help them if you narrow it down and say, well, you want to wear, you know, the blue jacket or the red one can help them to decide because yeah sometimes you just get stalled when you have too much choice I actually read that once that they said um when a store has too much selection they actually can have uh lower sales which I thought was really interesting but yeah like they said there were drugstores who discovered that when they had too many um selections of shampoo they actually sold less overall because I guess people sometimes would just get overwhelmed and end up not buying anything. So yeah, I thought that was actually quite fascinating. I guess we want choice, but sometimes maybe we don't want too much. Yeah, because then there's that fear of missing out, right? If there's so many choices and everything looks good, you're afraid, well, if I pick this one, what if it turns out that one was better? Because I've certainly had that with ordering food in a restaurant, right? Yeah. 
That's why I often pick the same few things. <laughs> I'll even tell myself, oh, next time we go there, I'm going to try something new. And then we get there and I'm like, no, no, I really want that same, uh, you know, tiger prawn shrimp dish again. So yeah, it's so good. This one's a little crooked, but you know what? It's going to be covered up with a darker color, so I'm not that worried about it. It's not going to be as perfect today. So we're almost at the edge of this diagonal here. So moving right along. Yeah, this area is not quite as much confetti, so... Yeah, it's interesting too because I don't know if that's changed because that article I read about too much selection resulted in actual less purchases, but that was like from the 90s and now we're really spoiled that you can find almost any variety of anything on the internet now that I wonder if that's still the case for, you know, brick and mortar stores. Because yeah, we're really spoiled by online shopping. You can find Anything you possibly can think of, somebody is probably already selling it. So, yeah. But yeah, it was kind of interesting where they said that's why grocery stores don't put all the basic staple items near each other. They force you to walk around the whole store. So the bread, the milk, you know, the eggs, the vegetables, those basic things that people need they they spread them out around the edges of the store so that way if you need to buy just bread and milk you're going to end up walking through so many departments that you're more likely to make them impulse buys so that was yeah it was actually quite a lot of interesting stuff like how they will pick slower paced music so that you walk slower because the more time you spend in the store the more you buy the more likely you are to buy an impulse item and um yeah, they said if you're looking for good deals, make sure you look um, beyond just the midpoint of the shelves. Look at the stuff that's right near the bottom and stuff that's right up at the top because they will often put the stuff they want to sell the most in the center. And a lot of times people will take it without really bothering to compare what's around it. And so you might find better deals when it's not right in that center area. So yeah, it's pretty interesting. All sorts of little... And there was... um. What was it? Oh, don't always buy in bulk because it's not always cheaper. Do the math. Right? Because, yeah, you might find that the package that has only eight granola bars is actually cheaper per, per piece than the one that's of 30 granola bars. Don't just assume that the bulk one is a, a better deal because that's not always the case. Yeah, so much uh, study goes into marketing, so... Okay, so I have two of this color. Let's see, ah, oh, that top one's long. Oops. That bottom one is a little shorter, but yeah, I plan to go in two directions with this, so that's not a problem. Because you can see it kind of uh, diverges and spreads apart, so. Yeah, so the only thing that kind of sucks about trying to get the stuff that's up at the top, if it's a better deal, is if you're like me, I'm super short. Ooh. Oh, I've had more than once where I had to pick up a package and sort of use it to knock something towards me so I could actually grab it. Ooh. Or have to find a tall person and ask them to take pity on me. <laughs> but then I don't want to be irritating, right? I don't know. If I was tall, would I be annoyed that people are always asking me to grab things for them? So... I don't want to be a bother. Mm. Yeah, my husband is taller than me, so I remember one time I was straining to grab like a mixing bowl out of the top cupboard, and he stands right behind me and grabs it like without even straining for it and hands it to me with this little smirk. I was like, yeah, you show off, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I said short people problem is when, uh, when cooking is a, a workout because you need to keep climbing up on the counters to grab stuff. <laughs> I actually saw a video where somebody had it where they'd built in these little um, uh, step stools that like they were 
sort of, uh, they would slide in between the cupboards and then you'd pull it out and fold it out and it made a little step stool. But then I was thinking, okay, that's a cool idea, but first of all, I'd be worried it would break and trying to fix that would be not fun. But also, that means there's more cracks in your um, countertop for stuff to fall down, like bits of food and things, and then you have to clean it. Because, I mean, have you ever cleaned, you know, between your oven and the, uh, and the countertop beside it? Oh, that's not fun, right? Trying to get in there and get everything out and sometimes you have to pull the oven right out of its uh out of its alcove which that's not fun either right so yeah the practical part of me was like i'm not sure i think i'll just stick to my uh i have chairs or step stools to climb on when i need stuff oh uh. yeah i said i don't like how it seems so many things they have um like cracks and grooves in them. It's like they're designed to catch dirt or something. Like we had our old fridge had this like crackle design across it, which kind of looked nice for, you know, when it's new. But then the problem is it gets, dirt gets all trapped in those grooves and it's so much harder to scrub them out. You can't just wipe it down because it gets caught in those grooves and oh, I hate it. Or like the interior doors that have the wood grain on them sometimes they're not even actual wood so why bother putting that on there because wiping that down is a pain and then if you do it too hard the paint comes off but if you don't you know scrub it down hard enough then the dirt is left behind it's, ugh. Oh, that's one thing I really liked about our new windows that we got the um the ledges have no extra grooves in them and they wipe clean so easily like you don't even need a wet cloth even just a dry duster across them and they're clean and uh yeah anything that cuts down on cleaning time i'm a fan of i want more time for stitching <laughs> okay thirty-seven sixty-six. Ooh. Pardon me. Uh. Hmm. Yeah, when my friend came over, she saw my um, my lap stand with my other project on it, the one, the Firefly, where I'm just doing the big background right now. And she was all excited. Oh, did you get your son to start trying stitching too? I said, oh, no, no, that's still mine. That way I can switch between projects without having to take the, uh, the Q-snap out of my clamp floor stand whenever I want to switch. Because, yeah, um, she had a couple of her kids tried it. But she's like, yeah, they stitched for about three days and that was it. So I wasn't able to uh, suck them into our world. <laughs> yeah, I'm always excited when I'm able to uh, introduce someone to a hobby that I love. That's always fun. Yeah, or it's like when you get to pass along a favorite movie recommendation or book recommendation to a friend and they... They enjoy it, and then you can talk about how much you love it after. That's always fun. Oh. Yeah, like, um, my husband, he's not a big crime show fan, although he will watch a few of them with me. I watch almost, you know, any crime procedural there is out there because I enjoy the mystery but um yeah he didn't I got him hooked on uh, Murdoch Mysteries which is a Canadian show set the early 1900s yeah late 1800s early 1900s and um he's a very scientific minded uh character 
who invents things that would have been um, possible with the technology they have at the time, but um, weren't invented. Like he made a metal detector and uh, he made um, a dye pack because they were catching a thief, uh, that kind of thing. And um, he calls it the exploding dye just discharger. He, the names he comes up with stuff is fun. And my husband was like, no, no, I'm not interested. Well, I watched it so much around him that he started to get interested and we ended up having to watch the whole show from the beginning so that he could understand the overarching storylines. And uh, yeah, that's going to start its like 16th season this fall. So yeah, there were a lot of shows to uh, watch. So that was fun. And then I found another one on Prime that I hadn't heard of when it first aired. It was called Grimm. And so it's like a, a procedural crime show, but it's um, got a fantasy twist. And he loves, my husband loves fantasy stuff. So um, like he really liked the show Once Upon a Time. Well, until they wrecked it at the end. <laughs> because he said they re basically rebooted it and started telling the exact same story from the beginning. Like, why? And he said, yeah, they aired maybe three episodes of that season and then it was cancelled because, yeah, nobody was impressed with that. Like, either write some new material or end the show, right? But, um, so anyway, this new show, Grimm, it's a similar kind of thing. It's a um, crime show, but it includes, um fantasy creatures, you know, dragons and um, werewolves and, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I watched the pilot and I said to him, no, you need to watch this with me. I think you'll like it. He said, okay, fine. Give it a try. And yeah. Now we're, uh, we're binging that one. So, yeah. And that was um, one that was by a big network, like NBC or CBS or something. And I don't think I ever heard of it when it was on. So, well, one kind of nice thing about discovering these shows now, years later when they're on streaming platforms, is you can, uh, you can binge them, right? You don't have to, uh, to wait each week and then take a break for months between seasons. And, yeah, especially because a lot of times, for some of them, I've forgotten a lot of what happened in previous seasons, and you end up having to uh, either look for recaps or start again. So yeah, it's kind of nice. Yeah, like we binged um, Smallville and uh, The Arrow I was talking about earlier. And um, oh, lots of them. Oh, Heroes, which was by NBC. I quite enjoyed that one. Again, if you like superhero stuff, that was, that was fun. Yeah, plus no sitting through ads. Yeah, it was funny because um, there was a thing going around saying, you know, you kids these days won't know the, the pain of missing an episode of your favorite show and you had to wait months for it to come back. You know, and they're like, well, why couldn't you just, you know, stream it? It's like, oh, honey, that, that wasn't a thing. <laughs> or pausing live TV, that was not a thing either. You had to time your bathroom breaks to uh, when there were commercials on. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, it was interesting. I learned recently, of course, everyone who's watched this, uh, my channel for a while knows I'm a big Star Trek fan. And um, Star Trek got off the ground partly in thanks to Lucille Ball of I Love Lucy. So many people passed on it and uh, she liked the idea and so she helped uh, produce it. And actually, um, a lot of people don't know that a lot of modern day things to do with television industry actually came from I Love Lucy. They were a lot of firsts. They were the first show to um, use three cameras to record so that they could have a, you know, far away close ups medium uh, settings for the cameras. Because they said before that a lot of stuff was basically like a play with just a camera sitting on a tripod, you know, and um, they changed that so they had multiple film to use and then cut things together so you could get close-ups and far away shots and stuff. And uh, yeah, and oh, and they were the first to do that in front of a live studio audience. And uh, oh, they were the first show to start doing reruns, which um, because they said, um, I think because it was higher quality film, the 35 millimeter film, it could be preserved well so that they could keep showing it. And so, 
yeah, reruns and syndication is where they make a lot of the money. And that wasn't a thing until um, I Love Lucy came along. And uh, what else? There was a bunch of stuff. This Oh, yes. They were the first show to depict a pregnancy because um, the act actress, Lucille Ball, actually was pregnant when they started the show. And um, I read her autobiography. She said they weren't sure that they could have kids. So it was a complete surprise. And they had just started the show when she discovered. And they thought, well, what are we going to do? And somebody said, well, why not just write it into the show? Why not have the character um, have a baby? And so they did. And, uh, you know, this is in the era where they couldn't show, you know, couples sleeping in the same bed. It was two little twin beds. And um, so, yeah, she, uh, the actress was pregnant and the uh, character was pregnant. And uh, the only thing is they could not use the word pregnant on air at the time. Yeah, I, it was actually, I really enjoyed reading her, her autobiography. And she said they had, um, you know, consultants on there. Like they had a rabbi, a priest, you know, you know, sounds like the beginning of a joke, right? But anyway, um, to watch the episodes for the content and make sure that it wouldn't be too offensive. Because, of course, you got to remember when this was made, right? And um, they weren't allowed to use the word pregnant. They had to say expecting. And she said it was actually quite funny because I think she said, the rabbi actually said, well, what's wrong with the word pregnant? You know, but yeah, no, the network would not allow them to say that. So it was expecting, but yeah, it was, a, uh, it was a uh, quite revolutionary. So it was really interesting. So yeah, you know, she plays like a silly scatterbrained character, but in real life, she was, a, uh, she was quite the uh, influence on the industry. A real a trailblazer. <laughs> so yeah, I haven't seen all of that show, but uh, did see some of it. goodness drop my needle but yeah so we have her to thank for having star trek it may never have gotten off the ground without her <clears throat> yeah i'll have to wrap this up not too far from now, because um, my son's got a bowling event today. So, uh, yeah, he's still with his speech therapy group. So in the summer, they do fun stuff like this. So they're going to do bowling and they're going to do archery. And uh, go to the splash park. So yeah, he's got some fun stuff planned this summer. Even if we don't end up going anywhere, we'll see. Because, yeah, like I said, with gas prices being what they are, the travel is hoo-wee. Yeah, I have quite a few friends who said they were going to go, they were planning to go places, but, oh. Because, yeah, we, we looked into it depending on which vehicle we take, because, of course, the big truck takes more fuel than my uh, element. But either way, we'd still be paying like 1500 to 2000 bucks for gas if we if we travel back to visit family so I think we may have to wait another year unfortunately because yeah just do a trip for some place that's closer I guess then we'll maybe go to the train museum or something we did um we actually went to the coal mine one year um where was it now I'm trying to think oh actually Hmm. I'm seeing the way everything else is parked here. I may do this differently. What I may do is, yeah, I may split this up. Because, as you know, I don't like to close stuff in. So, there we are. I was pulling on the wrong thread. But yeah, it was um quite fun. I can't remember where it was we actually went for that. But there was an old coal mine 
that of course has been turned into like a museum and you get to go on tours and you actually get to, um, they have a little track that you can ride a little old coal car on and they had a little part where you can switch it over. So um, of course all the kids got out to help the guy switch it over. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was blistering hot that year. That was years ago. I remember they gave you, um, because a lot of the tour was outside, they actually gave us spray bottles of water, said, here's your air conditioning. <laughs> so yeah, you'd be spraying yourself down at regular intervals to keep from overheating. <clears throat> yeah, they told us a lot of interesting stories too. They said there was um one of the donkeys who pulled the carts could actually count because um Every time they would push another cart onto the, you know, train of them and attach them, he would make a big clang sound and his ear would flap. And if you tried to put more than, I think it was like eight cars, he wouldn't move. So if they were able to push it up against the, um, the row of them and attach it without making a clang sound, it would pull it. So he, he was capable of pulling that much weight, but he just refused to. So if he knew there were more than that many cars because of the clang when they uh, put them together, yeah, he would just stand there, you know, as they say, stubborn as a donkey, right? Or whatever. He would just stand there and refuse to move until they removed one of them. So yeah, I thought that was quite, quite funny. And then they had an old um, little one room, like a miner's hut in uh, there. I'm not sure if it had been moved from another area or if it was original to that spot, but yeah, it was pretty neat. Made out of like, you know, clay and mud and stuff. Holds together pretty well considering how old it is. Yeah, I love museums and stuff. I could do that all day long. That was one thing I liked when we, um, we lived on Vancouver Island they have the Royal Victoria Museum, which is one of like the best museums in the country, maybe the world, I don't know. But um, yeah, we used to go there, you know, at least a half dozen times a year. And they would have different um, special exhibits that would come through. I was really sad when we moved away and I couldn't go there and they had an ancient Egypt exhibit. And oh, I wanted to go so bad because I just, I love history. And yeah, I didn't get to go to that. Um, oh, they had a Da Vinci exhibit. Oh, God, I would have loved to have seen that. My dad got to go because he had to go there for business. And so he stopped in and I was so jealous. Uh, I did get to see the Titanic exhibit, though. That was the year our son was born. So he was really little. But uh, we managed to go and uh, we had to carry him a lot. And he fell asleep in his stroller while we looked at stuff. So... That was nice, but yeah, I said I did not want to miss out on the Titanic exhibit. And I got to see, oh, there was um, one year they had um, the Gold Rush exhibit. And um, they had a scale that could actually measure what your weight would be worth in gold. So, yeah, I think at the time, because this was a while ago, but yeah, they said I was worth $2.1 million in gold. My husband was worth like 3.5, so yeah. That was cool. Oh, and I remember they have this one permanent exhibit, which is like an old town. So you can walk around and it's like an old town, like from the 1800s, got cobblestone streets and everything. And um, there's a barrel that sits in the corner and it has, um, it makes a cat meow sound sort of at regular intervals. Well, we didn't know. And so my sister was like nine or 10 and she sort of walks up and looks at this barrel. She sort of puts her hand on it to just, you know, cause it, it was one of those you're allowed to touch it. And just as she puts her hand on it, it makes the cat sound. Oh, she jumped so high. <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> oh. I was like, um, in Victoria, they also have the uh, wax museum there. And uh, we went there a uh, field trip when I was in high school and they have the um, the house of horrors part, right? And um, we were in there and one of the guys from my group, he was standing very silently in the corner and a couple of 
of uh, girls from another group didn't realize he wasn't a statue because he he did it on purpose. He's standing there really still and he came up to look at him and I was about to warn them, you know, that's a real person. I know him. He's in my class. And then he he goes, roar at them. They just scream and go running down the corridor because, of course, they were already on edge from all the, you know, the horrors in that uh, one. Oh. Uh. It was so funny. They were like, wow, he looks so real. And I was about to say, that's because he is real. <laughs> but then he scared them before I got a chance to warn them. <sighs> yeah, actually, my sister worked as an assistant uh, curator for a while at the museum in her city. But uh, she sells incense now like full time. So yeah, she started that business quite a long time ago and she's built it up over the years and it's uh it's pretty good now. It's called um leftover hippies incense. And um yeah, she hand rolls each piece with her own um her own recipes she's developed over the years. And uh there's none of that wax and other stuff they might add to a lot of the commercial ones. Hers are all natural, so yeah, they're quite popular. <clears throat> oh, it was so funny. She said to her, um, her daughter wanted her to make poop emoji ones. So she had a joke. She says, well, now I can say that my poop doesn't stink, <laughs> you know? And she says, and so, you know, it's a poop emoji, right? It looks like a turd. And um, she said, and this means when you light it on a fire, it'll be steaming. <laughs> <laughs> it's like well she said her husband's always saying it's good spelling crap so you know that was literally good spelling crap oh i just about died laughing at it but yeah so i said you know what scent is it what do you, if you could say your poop don't, doesn't smell she said yeah it's it's rose scented <laughs> oh. oh yeah that was pretty funny Oh, good. We've got some big areas coming up here. Yeah, that'll go faster. I'm just going to fill this in. This one single stitch, and then I think I may actually be able to put this color away for a while. Oh, no, we got a bunch up there, so. But soon, yeah, the lighter colors especially I'm coming to the end of. They were more prevalent in the center of this pattern when I was doing the sky. Now they're winding down because it's mostly dark colors for the rest of this design. We got the hedges and the pillars and all the shadows and the bushes. So yeah, it's mostly dark colors at that point. Although we have a little bit left in the swans and some of the flowers. My goodness, that's quite fuzzy and it's not going to want to thread very well. Okay. Oh, I had a lot more to say this time. <laughs> Not quite as tired this time, I guess. I'm bursting with more to say. Okay, there we go. Goodness, I can't seem to color that one in on my, on my tablet there. Hmm. Actually, this tablet's holding up pretty well. Sort of three-year-old tablet now. Especially because I don't really run anything that complicated on it. Pattern Keeper is not. It doesn't take up a ton of processing, I find. Not like, say, if I was running a game or something like that. But yeah, I keep this tablet pretty much just for, uh, just for cross-stitch. So yeah, that's good for that. Yeah, since it's a Android tablet, 
that runs um, Pattern Keeper, so uh, you can get those for cheaper than you can for the uh, Apple stuff is right, quite pricey. color that in. There we go. And then I can do a whole bunch of those after I get this one out of my way. Oh, that was not threaded. I guess I hadn't got to it yet. thought it would be because it's a long thread. Yeah, I guess I'm, I've moved out of this section and I'm down into a new part of the diagonal, so... So now I get to do a whole bunch at once, which I always like doing. Get into a bit of a groove with it. when you put it back in the wrong place you're really supposed to unthread your needle and pull it back and not try to thread it back through I know better but I was trying to I was being lazy yeah <laughs> and now you see why you don't do that because if you don't get it quite back up in the same spot yeah you end up with that problem you end up with a tangle could be harder to remove so Pardon me. Come on to the corner of the hedge here. So there's, yeah, where it cuts off right about here. I think this is most of the last of the lighter colors there for a while. Oh my gosh, the tree here. Ah. Mm. 
There. A little mixed up, but we got her. Oh, that's my Alexa. Got turned on by accident. Yes, I know. I know I said your name, but just, you can go away now. <laughs> Actually don't have that feature enabled. I just, it's just used as a Bluetooth uh, uh, stereo. <laughs> yeah, I, I got it free when I uh, renewed my phone contract. They actually gave us two of them. So gave one away to a uh, relative, kept one. I actually think the sound quality is not actually as good as my old stereo that finally died. Actually, it was my husband's from before we met. But, uh, yeah, that one finally, finally called it quits, but it had really good sound. And plus I said, I think I've been, um, I've been spoiled by my car stereo, which is really, really good. It's got a great subwoofer, so. Yeah, I usually have it turned all the way down because um, it'll come on for when people say stuff on TV or I don't even know you say something that I don't even know what the command is, but it must sound similar to something that I said and it'll randomly come on and tell me, it looks like your voice is not connected to the internet. If it says it loud enough, it scares the heck out of me. So <laughs> yeah, I generally have it turned off all the way down unless I'm actually using it to play music so it doesn't scare me. Hmm. I had to turn off Siri on my phone because every time I said seriously, it she thought I was talking to her. <laughs> and I apparently say that a lot more than I thought. So, yeah. Yes, I learned if you say um, Lumos to Siri, she turns your phone camera on. But then you can't turn it off. If you say like cancel or turn off flashlight or whatever, it doesn't. But yeah, if you say Lumos to say, hey Siri, Lumos, it will, um, she'll say, okay, I turn the flashlight on. But then yeah, I can get her to turn it off again. So I thought that was kind of funny though. Little party trick there. Okay, I may not bother carrying this one because it's not very long. And there's another thread of that color part nearby and it's longer if I remember correctly. So yeah, I think we'll see. Let me take a look. Actually, what I may do, yeah. Because if I end this off, the pieces aren't really that long enough to bother saving, but I'd feel like I wasted some. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to park it right in that one there. And I can do those two that are by themselves with that thread. That way it's not wasted. Yeah, I like that idea. <clears throat> Yeah, this area will go a little faster. Not quite as much confetti here.
safe pulling this thread through the hole will make that fuzzy come back up. Nope, we're good. Okie doke. Okay, I think we'll call it a day there. Yeah, I'm gonna need to wrap this up because I'm gonna need to take my kid to the bowling pretty soon. So um, thank you so much for uh, joining me again today and I hope to see you here again another time. All right, thanks everyone, bye.